Good evening and welcome. We're going to start this evening with hymn 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness, 139. Have you turned to 308? There is a Redeemer. 308. Son, son. 
Thank you, ladies. That was a pretty song. I didn't know that last one. I like that. You know, Tanya and I were sitting up here trying to figure out the time. Uh, I used my digital Fitbit that works off the satellite for the time. But there's a reason we go by this clock back here as preachers. Because we start with this one. Then if you go by that one, it's slow, so we get to preach longer. <laughs> so we're no dummies. <laughs> we figured that out a long time ago. <laughs> and that's why we don't tell our men to change the clock. <laughs> It's good to have you here this evening and back with us again. Hope all of you had a great day off and got some things done at home and around the house and stuff. And so I want to remind you again, how many of you have been here four nights now tonight? Wow, a lot of hands went up. Good. So remember, the fifth night, tomorrow night, you get your Bible promise book. Now, these items up here, if you'd like to take a better look at them and like to see them, they're back on the registration table or afterwards. You're more than welcome to come up here and look. There's some great books. I love that Bible Promises book. I keep one in my office so that sometimes when people come in or they're a little discouraged or something like that, I can look up some promises for them. So the, the, the next day, if you've been here 10 nights, we have this beautiful Bible for you. And it really is a nice Bible. I was looking through it the other day, and, and I can actually read the print, so it's not as small as you might think it is. So <laughs> it's a great Bible, beautiful Bible. And then, of course, the Strong's Concordance if, if you come 15 nights. And that's really a big help when you're researching things in the Bible or you come across something you don't quite understand. You can look up all the other texts that use that same word or that same phrase, and then you can put it all together and get the big picture, and it helps you understand it. It will also give you the definition of some words when you look in the back and that kind of thing. So it really helps. It's, it's a good resource tool that way. As I was thinking about these meetings, are you learning something? I'm learning a lot. I'm learning something new just about every night. It's amazing, and I appreciate it very much. I've been very, very helpful, very attentive to, to listen to as you share with us. A and I thought it was very timely, your last talk, with some of the things that have been going on in the news lately, <laughs> you know, with, with some of the stories that have been happening in the news. They just fit right in. A and so we know that we are getting in the time of the end that way. Well, it's good to have each of you here this evening. It's time for our theme song. we bring glorious carol we sing wonderful words of the king Jesus is coming again coming again coming again maybe morning maybe noon maybe surely soon coming again coming again oh what a wonderful day that will be Jesus is coming Good evening. All I have to say is, clock? What clock? <laughs> I don't look at a clock. There's a clock in here? <laughs> I guess it's in the back somewhere. I don't know, but yeah. No, we try to keep timely because I know people have things to do during the week too, but you know what's exciting is that we can get together night after night after night, and the Word of God continues to help us grow closer to Him and continues to excite us. And you know, if we keep studying... I think you're just going to be energized so that the work day just goes flies by because you're racing to get here by 7 o'clock so you can get back into the Word of God. Amen? So, you know, don't worry about being tired. God's going to take care of that for you. He's going to keep you rested up. So I, I do have one, two things I just thought of. I should have told you, but I've forgotten, and I, I'm thinking of them. When you came in, you got a, a sheet that has the rest of the seminar on it. And so there's a lot of topics on there. We're going to be talking about the return of the king tomorrow night and then false Christ and the son of perdition revealed. That's uh, specifically talking about the Antichrist. And then we're going to be talking about the almost forgotten day. The next day, identifying cults. We're going to look through the scriptures and we're going to understand how, how we can tell what, what's real and what's not. 
Bible truth about seances and ghosts, all sorts of things that go through there. Psychic sorcerers and spiritual gifts toward the end. The United States in prophecy, is that really true? Mark of the Beast and the Remnant of God, all those things. Fantastic subjects coming up. You're not going to want to miss a night. So take that home. Mark everything off on your calendar except the Bible study. Amen? Oh, that was an arousing applause. I thought I'd get a really big response for that, but no, that's okay. Just, uh, you know... Make it a priority to know the Lord and to study the Word. That's so important for you. Because if we're not walking with the Lord and studying the Bible day by day and in prayer with Him, we, uh, we're on dangerous ground. But we want to be with Him, and that's why we're here together. Uh, second thought I wanted to bring to you before we start tonight is that uh, I was told that this coming Saturday evening we're going to have a, a kind of a social kind of a gathering together afterwards for some... From, just some uh, refreshments and things but it's an apple social and sandy rudolph who's at the registration table she's going to have a a, tonight she has a trunk load of apples from their apple tree so if you would like to participate and you don't want to have to go buy apples sandy's willing to give you a bag of apples so you can go home and make a pie or bake apples or make apple crunch or apple turnovers or apple tarts or whatever you can make with apples and bring them then like next saturday night we can taste each other's apple treats and so that's what we're going to do next saturday evening so if you'd like to participate we'd love you to have you bring your favorite apple recipe and share it with us tomorrow or next this coming saturday evening so so if you need apples see sandy on the way out the door tonight so all right so let's look at our quiz from the other night it's been a couple of days so did we remember what we talked about We talked about Matthew 24, mostly. Quiz question number one says, In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says the earth will experience an increase in famine, pestilence, and earthquakes just before he returns. Is that true or false? True. Have we been seeing those things increase? True. We saw all sorts of evidence of that the other night. Quiz question number two, One sign of the nearness of Christ's second coming would be the decline of immorality in the world. Is that true or false? It's false. It would be an increase in immorality, not a decline in immorality. I know it's kind of confusing. But the, 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 it, immorality would become growing more and more and more prevalent in the world. And did we see evidence of that in the news and on research? Yes, we saw all sorts of that all over the place. Quiz question number three. The rise of racial tension we see today is predicted in the Bible as a sign that Jesus is coming soon. True or false? True, right? Nation shall rise against nation. Ethnos against ethnos. Ethnicity against ethnicity. Race against race. Jesus said, this is the way it's going to be just before I come. Folks, Jesus is just around the corner. Amen? He's almost here. And so we need to be ready to be facing not only things that are coming upon the world, but so that we can stand faithfully for Him. And so tonight we're going to talk about a very important topic. We're going to talk about not denying the power of God. It's very important. We look at this. We're talking about the deceptions in the world. We're going to look at some of those things tonight very closely because it's very near and dear to the Lord that we understand this topic tonight. So before we begin, I'm going to ask the Lord to be with us tonight. I'm going to kneel for you and uh, to pray, and you join me there with me, please. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we're here together again. Thank you for bringing us out, Lord, during the week, keeping us safe through the days that we've been apart. And Lord, tonight as we study your word, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be especially with us. I pray for your to be speaking to each and every heart that's here, Lord, leading us and teaching us what each of us needs to know. And Lord, you, I know that you know each and every one of us, for you say, you tell us in your word that you know the thoughts, even that we think. You know everything about us. You're acquainted with all of our ways. So Lord, we pray that tonight you would help us to become acquainted with your ways and your word. So we pray for your presence here with us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Not denying the power of God. Take your Bible and let's go back to Matthew 24 this evening. Let's start there. Remember, I told you we're going to take a look at a couple of these verses again when we got back together. Matthew chapter 24. And we don't have to read all of this 3 through 13 because we read it together the other night. But I'd like to point out a few issues here. As Jesus was being approached by his disciples, they're asking about what are the sign of your coming? What's the sign going to be that you are coming again? And the very first thing out of Jesus' mouth in verse 4 is Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. He says it again in verse 11. Follow down and look at verse 11. 
Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. He says it again in verse 24. For there shall, be false, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall grow, show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. He, over and over and over, Jesus says, look, be careful for deception. Now, we're Bible-believing Christians. We've got Bibles in our hands. Most of us have a Bible in our hand, if not all of us, the way it looks. And, and we are Bible-believing Christians. Now, I don't think that you and I are going to be so easily deceived by, oh, maybe witchcraft or, or occultism or psychics or, or, or UFOlogy and all of that kind of stuff. We're not, we're not going to be taken away with deceptions with that kind of stuff because we have the Word of God. We're grounded there, and we, we realize that those things are not godly and that those aren't things that we should be concerned with. And, and so we're not going to be deceived and pulled away from the truth by that type of trickery. So, and so Jesus, what he's talking about is not that kind of thing. He's talking about deception, but he's de- talking about deception in the religious realm. right? So if the devil wants to deceive you, he's going to deceive you somewhere where you're not going to be looking for it. And we wouldn't be looking for it in church, would you? I mean, you wouldn't look for deception in church in the religious area, but that's what he's talking about. He's talking about false prophets shall rise and deceive many. A false prophet is not somebody who's not acquainted with the Bible. As a matter of fact, we're going to look later on as we discuss spiritual gifts and we look at cults and different things like that. There's a lot of false prophets, the so-called false prophets. They're called false prophets. They're so-called prophets, but they don't stand the test of the Bible. And so we have to be careful not to be deceived Because ultimately, the one deceiving is the devil. Revelation 12, verse 9 says, That great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The devil is the deceiver. He's the arch deceiver, if you will. He's the captain of all deception. That's what that word arch means in the Bible, a captain of. He's the captain of deception. You might call him the superhero of deception, right? And he is the deceiver, and all deception in the world stems from his lies. And so we have to understand that where deception comes from, comes from the devil. And so we need to know where that comes from, because we need to know what deceive means. Deceive, according to the dictionary, means to ensnare, or to cause to accept as true or valid that which is false or invalid. Or it means to imply imposing a false idea or belief that causes ignorance, bewilderment, or helplessness. But the Greek word planao is very important for us tonight, which is the word Jesus uses. The Greek word planao, the word Jesus uses for deceive, means to cause to roam from safety, truth, and virtue. So deception causes you to roam away from safety, truth, and virtue. Now, get this. Deception causes you to roam. Who's doing the roaming? You're doing the roaming. You've chosen to roam away from safety, truth, and virtue. Because, see, deception pries upon that idea that you get to choose too. See, God gives all of us the opportunity to choose. He never takes that right away from you. You always can choose. You can choose to believe in Jesus. You can choose to believe in a tree. You can believe, choose to believe in a rock. You can, God says, look, go ahead and choose to believe whatever you want to believe. I'm not going to force you to do anything. But deception causes you to roam away from that which is safe, that which is true, and that which is virtuous. Okay, so that's what the word deceive means there in Scripture. So when you see that, apply that and say, hey, whatever this is, it's causing me to roam away from safety, from virtue, and from truth. And so let's go back to the original deception in Genesis chapter 3 1. If the devil was the arch deceiver, he's the beginning, right, of it, let's look at how he started. Let's look at how he works. Because it helps us, you know, it's wonderful about the Bible that God kind of gives us the game plan of the devil. He kind of gives us the game plan of the enemy. He shows how the devil works time and time again. We can say, hey, he's, he's got nothing new. He's done that before. And we see, look at it over so we can see it in, around us so we can recognize it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? So here's Satan, and he's in the garden, and in this first time we're introduced to Satan, he's the serpent, and he says he's the, he's the most subtle creature, which means he's the most sneaky creature there, right? And so he's, he's subtle, more than any other beast of the field. And the first thing he does when he comes to Eve, 
He says, has God really said this? So what he's trying to do is cast doubt upon what has God really said. He's trying to get Eve to think, did God really say that? Or did he mean this? Or did he say that? Or, you know? And so this is what he's trying to do. He's casting doubt upon what God has really said. And Eve has this conversation with him, and, and the deception goes on. But this is where he starts. He starts by pulling out the rug, if you will, of your confidence in what God has said. And that happens today all over the place. People don't trust in the Bible. They say, well, God didn't write that. God didn't say that. This isn't what the Word says. No, if the Bible said it, that's the way it is. We just, I just had a conversation with somebody tonight. And it, what the Bible says is absolutely true from cover to cover. There's no fables in here. There's nothing false in here. It's consistently true, unerringly true. And it's been that way because God inspired it. You might say God wrote it. It's just guys, use, men use their fingers and pencils to write it down. But God impressed this word upon people. And so it's not, there's not going to be any error in it because God doesn't error. And so this is a true book from beginning to end. And so don't let somebody deceive you into thinking that some part of the Bible is inspired and some part of the Bible is not and some part of it is true and some part of it isn't true. This is a complete work. It's a complete word of God. Okay? Amen? All right, let's go on. Don't be caught by deception, causing you to roam away from truth. And so in Matthew 24, Jesus says this in verses 12 and 13. He says, Because iniquity shall abound, we read this last night, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that endureth to the end, shall, the same shall be saved. So in, when they write in the Bible, sometimes you'll notice, especially when the Hebrew writers write, especially in the Old Testament, but Matthew is a Hebrew and he's writing with the same kind of grammar, they, when they use their verse, they, kinda, they say one thing and then they say the opposite in the second half of the verse. And so they, they kind of give you a plus and a negative, or a negative and a plus. You know, they kind of show you both sides of the same bread, right? One buttered, one not, right? And so here he's saying, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But on the other side, but he that endureth until the end, the same shall be saved. So this idea of iniquity and endurance are set at odds with one another. Iniquity, we know, is sin, right? That's another word for sin in the Bible. Iniquity, but he that endureth shall be saved. Right? And so there's these two things separated and they're on opposites. So we're going to understand what iniquity is tonight and we're going to understand what enduring means tonight. Because Jesus talks about it here and it's talked about in Revelation as well. And so we're going to find out what endurance God is talking about in the Bible that we have to understand that is the opposite of iniquity. And so when we look at Matthew, he says, look, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. At the end of time, this is what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Turn there with me. 2 Timothy chapter 4. What kind of times will people be living in? Remember, we're talking about deceptions, and not just deceptions out there that says, you know, Santa Claus is real. He's not, by the way. That's a fable, right? I don't think I'm blowing anybody's bubble out of the air here, so... But, you know, I mean, th those are th fables, right? They're things that sometimes people believe in. They're but the Bible says very certain things are true. And Bible says that there's some things happening at the end of time. Math 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, says this. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And so what they're going to be doing is deceived, right? They're going to be deceived. They're going to be turned away from the truth unto fables. Are fables true? No, they're deceptions, right? They're deceptions. And so these people are looking for teachers they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And in verse 3 it says, they, because of their own lusts, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They want teachers to tell them what they want to hear. That's what this says. People at the end of time, the days we're living in, they want preachers to be up here saying, well, you know, the Word of God, it's all light and fluff, and you're going to be, you know, you're going to be well all the time, and you're going to be rich all the time, and you're going to be, you know, all of this, all, it's blessing, 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 never a heartache, never a sorrow, never, I mean, they want to hear all this good stuff, right? They want teachers to be up there saying, hey, you can live any way you want as long as you claim the name of Jesus. You can do whatever you want as long as you claim the name of Jesus. That's not the Bible, my friends. Those are teachers that people have heaped up because of their itching ears. 
and they don't want to cling to sound doctrine anymore. Because the Bible has very distinct values in it, and God wants us to stick to those. And so Jesus and Timothy, in the book of Timothy, are very synonymous here. We're seeing the likeness is what ha- was happening. People want people to teach them to deceive them. It seems kind of strange, but it's happening. And Jesus said it would happen. So we go back to Matthew chapter 7. What's the end result of this self-deception or this heaping up deception? Matthew chapter 7. I'll tell you ahead of time, this is probably one of the most disturbing passages for me in all of Scripture. It causes me the most pause. It causes me the most uh, angst when you look at it and when you read it and you, you say, wait a minute, how can this be in the Scriptures? I was going to read that for you. Chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Those are miracles, by the way. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why is that disturbing? Here's people who are, they're saying to Jesus, Lord. Jesus is Lord, they're saying. Lord, Lord, you're my Lord. And we've done all these things. We've done miracles in Jesus' name. We've cast out devils in Jesus' name. They've done all these things. And Jesus looks at them and says, I never knew you. Isn't that disturbing? It puts me back and I'm saying, okay, I don't want to be somebody like this. I don't want to be a person who's saying, Lord, Lord. But Jesus doesn't know me. So how, how then do we not be in that crowd, right? Who wants to be in that crowd? Yeah, my hand's not up. That was an example, right? <laughs> Who does not want to be in that crowd? I do not want to be in that crowd, right? I don't want to be caught so deceived, so self-deceived that I'm calling Jesus Lord and He doesn't know me. That's a dangerous place to be. That is a self-deceived place to be. So what's the answer? The answer is in the verse, actually. The answer starts there in the verse. Verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So it's not enough to claim Jesus as Lord. There's doing the will of God seems to be what Jesus was looking for. And so what then, I think a most important question for us tonight then is this, what is the will of God? Don't you think? If just saying, Lord, Lord, isn't enough, and I must, I must say, Lord, Lord, but I must do the will of God, then I need to know what the will of God is, right? Do you want to know what the will of God is, or should we go home? No, we want to know what the will of God is, right? Because we don't want to end up saying, Lord, Lord, and not have Jesus know us. So what is the will of God? The Bible tells us. Isn't that neat? The Bible tells us. Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Thy law is within my heart. The will of God and the law of God are the same. Psalm Romans 2.18 And knowest his will, and to approve us the things that are most excellent, being instructed out of the law. How do I know those things that are most excellent in God's eyes? I'm instructed out of the law of God. Hosea, back in the Old Testament, God had a controversy with his people. In Hosea chapter 4, he says this, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery. Have you seen that list anywhere? Does that list seem familiar to you? Yeah, we'll look at it later. They break out and blood touches blood. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. God had a controversy with his people there in Hosea. They had forgotten the law. They were going around, they were committing all sorts of these, what we would call sins, right? All of those sins. And God says, look, I've got a controversy. You've forgotten the law. You've rejected knowledge. And so there seems to be something to that. God has a law. He has a ten, the Ten Commandments are God's law, actually. When you look at the Bible, God, matter of fact, in the Bible there's multiple laws, but the main law that God is impo- impressed with and he's not impressed with, he's he's impressing upon us to see is the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And that's what he was talking about there because you can see that list in what he's talking about. They went out and they were were killing and they were stealing and they were swearing and they were committing adultery and blood coming to blood. Those are all against the Ten Commandments. 
And so God has a law, and it said that his will is his law. Right? These are ten commandments. And it makes sense when you look at it. Think of what Jesus says. John chapter 4, verse 34. My meat, he says, my food is to do the will of him that sent me. Who sent Jesus? God did, right? So he's, I'm doing God's will, he said. What was God's will? Well, Jesus it tells us in John 15, or John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. See how the Bible is so consistent? In Psalms, the psalmist said, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart, which actually was a psalm prophesying about the Messiah. And Jesus is here, and he says, look, I'm about doing the will of the Father. And what was that will? And he says, look, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So we know that the will of God is, it's to keep the commandments of God. It's, it's walking after the, the law of God and living accordingly. Where did this law come from? Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. Some interesting things about the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 31, 18, God gave it to Moses. We know this story, right? Moses went up on the hill, on Sinai, Mount Sinai. Verse 18, it says, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Now here's an interesting thing. Remember, the first night I told you all of Scripture was written, you know, it was in, you know, man wrote it down and God impressed it, but there was some Scripture that God himself wrote. The Ten Commandments is it. God wrote the Ten Commandments. God called Moses up onto the mountain. God cut out two tables of stone. And then he wrote on them with his finger. It says there, written with the finger of God. The Bible describes it as a fiery law. He writes it, and then he gives it to Moses. Moses carries it down the mountain. Right? And then Moses does something. He hears the noise in the camp, and the Israelites are, the Israelites are uh, they're, they're reveling. They're actually they're idol-worshiping already. And so when, if you have your Bibles there, turn to Exodus chapter 34. Something incredible happens. Exodus chapter 34. Moses comes down, and if you've seen the movie, right? The, what he does is he sees this, and he, he sees that they've already broken the covenant of God. He takes the two tables of stone that God just gave him. God was writing with his finger on these. you think he'd be more careful. And he throws them down, and they shattered on the ground. He shattered them. It was a symbol that they had already broken the covenant that God was going to make with them. And then in chapter 34, God says this to him in the very, very first verse of chapter 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. So he says, Moses, you broke them. You make two more. Okay? So Moses goes, to go, Moses goes, and he has to chisel out two more tables of stone, just like the first. And then God says, And I will write upon those words that were in the first tablets, which thou breakest. God didn't write the commandments one time. He wrote them twice. God was not going to let Moses try to remember what God wrote down. He wasn't going to leave it up to man. The Ten Commandments were so important. God said, look, I'll write it once with my hand, with my finger. But there was broken. He said, look, you can cut the stone this time, but I'm writing it again. God did not leave the Ten Commandments to be written by man at all. God wrote them down so we would know exactly what they were supposed to be. Ten Commandments are a beautiful thing. Did you know? You think about it. If we, everybody lived according to the Ten Commandments, what kind of a world would it be? Right? We can't even describe it. We can go, wow, that'd be great, but I can't even describe it. We can't fathom what the world would be like if people just lived by the Ten Commandments. It would be peace. It would be joy. It would be harmony. It would be, there would be no, there would be no, there would be no, no, it'd be, it'd be great. You can't describe it even. So, I mean, and, and it's simple. You think of those Ten Commandments, ten simple little rules, boop, 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 and all of, every sin that you can think of, is encompassed in those ten little lines. You and I could have never written it so simply and so comprehensively all at the same time. Only God could have done that. It's an amazing thing. And so God has written it with his own finger, and he, it was so important, he made it part of his covenant. Okay, part of the covenant. It was the basis for the covenant with you and I. And he declared, the Deuteronomy chapter 4.13, he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. You know, that's why in the, in the temple where the Israelites had, they had that Ark of the Covenant. You, you read about that in the Bible, the Ark of the Covenant. It was called the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony because the two tables of covenant, the two tables of the Ten Commandments were inside that Ark. It was called the Ark of the Covenant because the, the foundation of God's covenant was in the Ark, in that Ark. And so it was the 
Ark of the Covenant. And so that was that important to God. And so it was there. It was his covenant to us. But you might think, well, that was to the Jews, so it's not to us. But wait a minute. That wasn't the first time the Ten Commandments show up in Scripture. We look back into Scripture, and God talks to Gen- in Genesis chapter 26, verse 5, God speaks about his commandments long before Mount Sinai. Genesis chapter 6, 26, verse 5. There it says, Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments and my statutes and my laws. He said, Abraham kept my commandments. So God already had his commandments way back in Abraham's day. Matter of fact, I can think back, just logically, we can think back a little farther along because when, when Cain and Abel were there, Adam and Eve's sons, right, the first two sons, Cain and Abel were there and Cain slew his brother, right? He murdered his brother and Cain got in trouble for that. God said, look, if you do right, it, it, but it was a sin. And Cain was, was, he was banished from, from the family because of it. Why was it wrong if there was no commandments? because thou shalt not kill, was still there. Matter of fact, I can think back a little bit farther than that, and I I guess I don't know how long beyond that, but way, way back into heaven, where an angel named Lucifer decided that he wanted God's throne, and he was going to deceive as many angels as he possibly could to get that and overthrow God, and Lucifer himself broke the Tenth Commandment, because he coveted God's throne, coveted God's glory, and coveted the worship that was due God. He, he broke the Ninth Commandment because he was bearing false witness against his neighbor. He was, bearing, he was lying about God. He was lying to the angels because he deceived them to follow him. There's, the only way he could have gotten them to fall away from God was to deceive them. And, so, and, and he must have broken the First man because he put himself as high God. He wanted the worship, so he made himself as high as God. So thou shalt have no other gods before me. So we know he broke at least three just off the top of my head. And I think if we think about it, he probably broke them all, right? James says if you broke one, you've broken them all anyway. But so we see that the law of God was even there in heaven. Lucifer was breaking them, and he was cast from heaven for for doing those things there. And so it's interesting to see that the law has always been there. And we're going to see some more indication of that tonight, how eternal the Ten Commandments, that law of God, really is, that moral code that God asks us to live by. Psalm 119, 142, how does the Bible describe the Ten Commandments? The Bible describes it this way, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. The law is the truth. Remember what deception is? To cause you to roam away from truth, safety, and virtue. Right? Truth, safety, and virtue. Deception is to draw you away from the truth. The law is the truth. John 14, 16 and John 17, 17 tell us the two other truths we find in the Bible. Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me but by the Father, but unto the Father but by me. And John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Jesus gives us two other understandings of what truth is. The word is truth, the word of God that you have in your hand tonight is truth. Jesus himself is truth, and the Bible says the law is truth. So those are your three truths in the Bible. Jesus, the Word, and the Ten Commandment Law of God. That's what the Bible describes as truth. And so that's pretty important for us to realize and carry through because if we want to be like Pilate and sit there and say, what is truth, and then not wait around for the answer, I think we want to wait around for the answer. We want to stop and say, wait, what is truth? And the Bible says the truth is Jesus, the truth is the Word, and the truth is the Law of God. How else does the Bible describe the Ten Commandments? My tongue shall speak of all thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. You know, what happens sometimes is I run into people and they say, well, pastor or preacher or minister or whatever they want to call me. Sometimes they don't call me such nice things. But they'll say, hey, look, you know, we have, we, we have crossed a, a, a threshold in the Christian world. We don't, we don't need the commandments. We don't have to worry about the Ten Commandments because Jesus did away with the Ten Commandments when he was crucified on the Calvary. They were nailed to the cross. They're, they've been done away with, the Bible says. We're, we no longer have to keep them. It's, it's all burdensome to keep those Ten Commandments. But the Bible says they're righteousness. 
So are, what is, is the argument then to say that we're doing away with righteousness, that Jesus nailed righteousness to the cross and we don't have to worry about righteousness anymore? See, that doesn't make any sense to me. And so we have to look at how the Bible describes this. The Bible says the law is righteousness. Romans 7.12 says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. We certainly don't want to do away with holiness or justness or goodness, do we? And so if the law is this good and the law is holy, which is important because there's very few things in the Bible God calls holy, he says the law is holy, it's just, and it's good, why wouldn't we want to do it? I mean, we just agreed, all of us together, that if everybody lived by the Ten Commandments, the world would be such a wonderful place, right? So why in the world wouldn't we want to live by them? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me why we'd want to push that aside. And God doesn't want us to push it aside either. He wants us to live according to as He's called us. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, Jesus is speaking here. Take your Bible and turn there with me. Matthew chapter 5. On the... On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about the law. And some people say, well, you know, Jesus said he's going to do away with the law. But listen to what Jesus says when he speaks about the law. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So there's a couple points in this passage right here that we have to look at. One is that Jesus says, whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so. So you're saying, well, look, I'm going to break this and you can break it too. And what the Bible says is they shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven doesn't mean they'll be least in the kingdom of heaven that terminology there in the greek it what it it implies is heaven calls them unworthy of heaven heaven is looking at that so look you're going to break a commandment and teach people so you're not worthy to even be in heaven you're called least and those who do them and teach them they are called great which means you are worthy to come to heaven. So there's a distinction Jesus is making about how we address these Ten Commandments in our lives and how we, how we address them to one another. And then he says in verse 17, well, in verse 18, he says, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. He says, look, not one little cross of a T or a dot of an I, nothing of that is going to change. Nothing is going to change from the law of God until it's all fulfilled. In verse 17, I'm working way back up, by the way. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. Jesus says specifically, I didn't come to destroy the law, do away with the law. I am not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. And it's interesting, there's two times the Bible translates a word fulfilled in that passage. And so what do those words mean? Because they're different words in the Greek. The first fulfill, Jesus says, I, have come to fulfill, I haven't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill is the Greek word pleruo. And it means to make replete or to cram, to level up, to satisfy. Jesus came to satisfy the law. The law says you live perfectly or you die. That's what the law says. There's no mercy with the law. And we couldn't satisfy it. People couldn't satisfy it. People were failing all the time. And God said, look, I need need a better plan here. I I need somebody has to satisfy the law so that I can save my people. I can save you and you and me and his creatures that he's created. And so Jesus came to satisfy the law. That's why we read him saying, I have done all my God's, all of the Father's will. I have kept his commandments. He lived a sinless life. He satisfied the law. And so that's what he says. I've not come to destroy it. I came to satisfy it. He satisfied it for you and I because we needed someone to satisfy it because you and I, none of us have had a very pretty background, right? We've all done things wrong in our past. We've all had to go to our knees and say, Lord, please forgive me. Some of us more than others. And I'm speaking about myself. I mean, some of us have a lot to praise God that he's been willing to forgive us for. And, and beca- it's because Jesus was there to satisfy the law for us. But he goes on, he says, I have not come to destroy but to fulfill, and not one jot or one tittle is in no wise going to be changed from the law until all be fulfilled. It sounds like, well, if Jesus came and he fulfilled it, then it's all going to be changed. But that word is different. It's the Greek word genomai, 
It means to cause to be or to come to pass. It's talking prophetically. It's saying, look, nothing is going to change until all of the whole thing is done. Everything is going to transpire. All of the prophecies have to come, and nothing is going to change. He basically is saying, look, if the earth is beneath your feet, the law is still there. Until heaven and earth pass, the Ten Commandments are still valid and still applicable to you and I today. Now, that's not taught a lot in the world in Christianity today, is it? It's not. A lot of people say, oh, no, 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 you don't got to worry about the Ten Commandments. That's all bondage. That's all legalism. You know, we're going to talk about that one of these days coming up. Which night is it? Huh. It's not on there. Oh, we'll fit it in. We're going to talk about it. No, we are. We're going to talk about it because it's important for us to understand this idea of what grace and legalism and grace and the law and how all of this works with the covenants and the new and the old covenant. We're going to stick it in here. I'll, we'll find something. We'll, we'll, we'll pick another special time and we'll fit a special session. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, I'll, I'll take that as okay. Uh, we, could, we can kind of run by the hip here, can't we? Yeah, we can do that. But we'll okay it with all of you before we schedule it. Is that all right? Okay. <laughs> but no, we're going to do that because this is important. Because it's all over Christianity today is that, look, you, oh, oh, you're going to teach the Ten Commandments? Then you're putting your people in bondage. I had a pastor actually say that to me. I've heard a pastor preach that on national television. Any preacher who's preaching the Ten Commandments is putting his parishioners under bondage. Far, far from the truth. The Bible calls it the Ten Commandments the law of liberty. Did you know that? It's the law of liberty. It's amazing what the Bible describes and sometimes what people teach. Psalm 111, 7 and 8 says, The works of His hands are verity and judgment, and His commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. God's commandments stand fast forever and ever. There's no changing to it. Matter of fact, God Himself says, I change not. With Him there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. And, and you know, I can, I can, believe, I can I, I feel safe trusting in God because He says He doesn't change, Right? He's not varying. He doesn't move around. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he says, this is what righteousness is, then I know that in a thousand years, this is what righteousness is. It's not going to change. And if I know another thousand years go by, God isn't going to change. And this is what righteousness is. And this is what God expects of me. And so that's what, and, and God wants to show us that he doesn't change and his law doesn't change either. So my question is this, for some people who say, well, the law has been done away with. When you look around the world, and this, this is a serious question, you look around, look at the news, look at the town, whatever, do you see sin in the world? Yeah. So, okay, second question, how do you know? What do you use to determine what sin is? Yeah, some of you say the commandments, right? I do too. Well, I mean, that makes sense, because that's what God said. I mean, this is the, idea, this is the whole thing. If we say the Ten Commandments are gone, then how, then how do we determine what sin is? Well, I get to determine for myself what's right and what's wrong. You see, that's the thought in the world today, too. A lot of people want to be their own lawgiver. They want to be their own judge. They don't want to say God's judge. They don't want to say, oh, God made a, a way of moral living that we have to abide by. I can choose to live whatever way I want as long as I'm not hurting anybody else, right? But that's not what the Bible says. Because you and I might look at them and say, look, you know what? The Bible says that that lifestyle or that action or that deed or those words, that's sinful, that's sinful. And we use the, the Ten Commandments to decide what it is. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Sin equals the breaking of God's commandments. That's what the definition of sin is in the Bible. So it's no wonder that we all said the commandments, right? Because you look and you say, oh, that's sin. How do you know? Because they just broke a commandment, right? Whether it be in deed or in thought or in word or whatever. And so the Bible describes sin as breaking the commandment of God. So Romans 4.15 says, where there, Because the law worketh no wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression, which means there's no sin. And, that, in, and this is the idea the devil wants us to get in our heads, that there's no law. And he would love that because if there's no law, there's no sin. right? Because the Bible itself says where no law is, there is no transgression. There's no sin. There's nothing to break. And there, were, there have been people who preached that too. His name was Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. He was a Cuban. He called himself the Antichrist and Christ. He was kind of confused. He thought he was both. But he had said, I came first and I lived a pure life. Now I came and I'm going to live a life of sin just because it's fun. That's what he said. And he, had, he has millions of followers, even though now he's dead. 
But, uh, you, you know, he, and he taught that there is no more law. There's nothing, you can't sin anymore because the law has been done away with when I died on the cross. And so you can do whatever. You can live any way you want. You can speak any way you want. You can watch whatever you want. You can do whatever. There is no sin anymore. And that's how he lived. And that's why he died young. But God said the law continues. Romans chapter 3.20, though, we have to understand the purpose of the law. Remember, we're talking about not denying the power of God tonight. It's important for us. Keep that in mind. Not denying the power of God. What is the purpose of the law? Okay, so what I'm saying is the Ten Commandments are still there. Jesus didn't nail them to the tree. Okay, so what's the purpose of them? What is the purpose of that law sitting there looking at me? Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Yeah, we're there. For Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So just like we just... We, we all agreed, how do I recognize sin? I look at the law. So the Ten Commandments tell me what sin is. It gives me a knowledge of sin. So when I'm walking through the world and God says, look, be careful, don't get caught up in this because that's sin. It helps me recognize sin out there so I stay away from it. Right? As a child of God, I know not to walk into that bar. I know not to walk into that establishment. I know not to go to this place. I know not to watch this program. I know not to take that money out of that till because it's not mine, right? We know that because the law has told us that is sin. And so we stay away from sin. Why does God want us to stay away from sin? Because it's your sin that has separated us from God. Isaiah chapter 59, 2, it says, But your iniquities have separated you between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. Because God doesn't want us to be separated. You know, it wasn't God's idea that man would sin and that we'd have to be separated from him. You know, in the Garden of Eden, it was Adam and Eve and God, and they walked hand in hand in the mists of the Garden of Eden. It was a beautiful place. I always tell people it was a perfect place with perfect people having com perfect communion with a perfect God. It was perfect. There was nothing there that was imperfect. And, and, but that was lost, and God's heart's breaking because it's been lost. We, I mean, we forgot. What, we don't even know what it was like, but God, His heart is breaking because His children can't come home. He wanted us to be with Him forever. That's why He created us for His pleasure, for, for us to interact with Him. And now we've been separated because of the sin, and God says, look, don't go chasing after that. That's what separates you and me. And so he gives us his law and say, stay away from that. Then that's the pur purpose of the law. But there's more to the purpose of the law in James chapter 1. Take your Bible and turn over to James, right after Hebrews, New Testament. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 23. The law has another purpose. And we're actually going to begin in verse 22 of James chapter 1. Is everybody there? Say Amen. I'm going to just say amen if you're there. <laughs> I didn't just say say amen, right? Are you, are you all there? Say amen. amen. Fantastic. I didn't mean you just say amen. I meant, you know, okay, never mind. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word. Just remember what Jesus was saying. They, not those that say, Lord, Lord to me, but those that do the will of my Father. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Wow. You can actually cause yourself to roam away. Look at that. Deceiving your own selves, verse 23. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror, maybe some of your Bibles say. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straight forward, straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So here's the thing. What James is saying is the, the law of God is like a mirror, okay? And when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you realize, oh, I have pizza left over on my face from last night and my hair is sticking up at four different angles, I need to do something with myself before I go to work, right? The mirror shows you what's wrong. The mirror shows you where there's dirt on you. And the law of God does the same thing. When we as Christians, we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. I've seen the sins out there. And we look at the law and we say, oh, I've done this, and I've done that, and I've done this, and I've done this. It doesn't, always, it doesn't just point to sin out there. It points to sin in here. 
So the law has a dual purpose. It, it points to the sin out there to keep me from that. It points to sin in me so that I can go to Jesus because it drives me to the cross saying, Lord, I need forgiveness. I need you to help me clean up. I, I can't get this off. I don't know how to get rid of this. And God says, come to me and I'm going to forgive you of your sins. First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So the law is the law's not there as a washcloth. It's just there to show you where your sin is. And so we see these two purposes of the law, to recognize sin out there and to avoid it, and to recognize sin within myself to drive me to Jesus. To drive me to Jesus. That's the purpose of the law. So then why should I keep it? If, it's, if the purpose is there and the purpose is there, do I have to keep it? Well, what do you think? What do you think? Would God want us to keep the law of God? Why would the Bible give us a reason? Do you think the Bible gives us a reason? Sure it does. The Bible gives us a reason. Why does God want, why would God say, why keep the law? Straight from the lips of your Savior, he says this in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he says in verse 21, he that keep hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Jesus says the first and very first <laughs> important reason to keep the commandments of God is because you love Jesus, because of what he's done for you. You don't keep the commandments to be saved. It, that doesn't work. You can't do it because you've already broken some in the past, and so doing, being good now isn't going to do you any bit of good. Even if you were good from the beginning, somewhere along the line, you thought a bad thought. You can't be good enough to go to heaven. Nobody can be good enough. You can't just say, well, I'm a good person, and you know, I think the Lord will pass on you know, a few indiscretions. No, because the law says it has to be lived. You have to have that life with Christ. You have to be connected with Jesus. But Jesus says, if you love me, if you recognize what I've done for you, I died on Calvary. I was sinless. I was that lamb that had no sin. It had no responsibility for all the sin of the world, and yet I chose to die for you so that you might have a chance of forgiveness and eternal life. If you're grateful for that, if you're at all thankful for that, if you love me for that, then keep my commandments. It's a response of our love for our Savior that we choose to obey the commandments of God. That's why Jesus says to obey them. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. If we go there, it says we are called to, from sin to obedience. When God calls us to, when we're living a life of sin... I used to be a bar manager in Fargo, bartender before that, lived a pretty rough life. I lived a life of sin, and God called me from that. He rescued me, and he said, okay, Joel, I'm going to forgive you of your sins. I'm going to, I'm going to grant you a, an opportunity for eternal life, but I don't want you to keep doing what you're doing. I want you to now live differently, and called from sin into a life of obedience. It just makes sense. God's not going to call you from a life of sin to put you back into a life of sin and say, yeah, well, I don't really care, right? So what's the reason? You know, that doesn't make sense. And the repentance would mean nothing. And so God wants to, he calls us from a life of sin into a life of obedience. It's exactly what 1 Peter 1, 2 says. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. That's you and I, we're the elect. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Holy Spirit unto obedience. The Holy Spirit comes into your life and is sanctifying you unto obedience. Obedience to what, do you think? The Ten Commandments of God. The Ten Commandments of God. The will of God. In the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace be multiplied, he says. So it's the Holy Spirit working in us, driving us and giving us the strength to move us towards obedience, right? Not toward disobedience. That would be silly, right? That would be silly. 1 John 5, verse 2 and 3 says, By this we know that we love the children of God. How do we know we love each other if we're Christians? When we love God and keep His commandments. You know what Jesus said the two greatest commandments are? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? We see those two plus keep the commandments all in this verse. Did you know that? How do you know that you love the children of God? Love your neighbor as yourself? When we love God, love God with all your heart, your soul, with all your mind, and keep his commandments. So obviously, they don't eliminate the commandments at all, do they? Those two commands of Jesus. Those two commands of Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
they summarize the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are summarized by those two. The first four commandments, when you look at them, you shall have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take, have any graven images and bow down to them or pray to them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Those four all show our love toward God. They all are our are, are, are love toward God. And you look at the last six, you know, the, 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 all of those, whether it be stealing, adultery, or lying, or, or honoring father or mother, or covetousness, or all of those, those are all pointing toward our love for our fellow man. So you see these two tables of stone. One is toward love for God. One is love for man. And Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments by saying, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. But when you summarize something, you don't remove the detail, do you? If I have you read a textbook and say, look, summarize chapter 4 for me. And you, you, know, you, don't, you don't rewrite the whole chapter. You summarize it in a paragraph. And, but you, that, because your summary is there, does it eliminate the, the, all the information in that chapter? Not at all. It's a summary. And that's what Jesus was doing. He's summarizing. Matter of fact, Paul in Romans says the very same thing, that those two things compass the entire law. They, they hold in the entire law, those two, those two sayings. 1 John 5, verses 2 and 3, verse 3 says, For this is the love of God. How do you know you love God? That we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. You know, sometimes people think that, oh, they got to keep the commandments. That's going to be such a burden. I'm a Christian, but it's still a burden. Really? You know, I mean, come on. I mean, it's going to be a burden to keep the commandments of God. As a Christian, you love the Lord, you love Jesus, you know what the Bible says, is it really a burden not to steal? Is it really a burden not to kill your neighbor? Even though you might want to. Right? But Jesus says even the thought is a sin, right? We've got to be careful, right? The this, this law is more than just action. It's thoughts, too. Is it really a burden? Really? I mean, I mean think about it. Is the law of God such a burden? It's not to, it, just, it just says, look, this is the best way to live. And God says, look, if you keep this, there's blessings involved. There's blessings. You don't have to do any jail time. I mean, it's plain as, that's an easy one, right? Who wants to do prison time? I mean, the whole idea is that God said, look, none of this is grievous, so why do you argue against me, he says. Why would we argue against God, who wrote this down for us and says, look, if you love me, do this. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. That's all God's saying. 1 John 2, 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I'm always glad that God said that and not me. Because that's a hard statement. Someone who says, look, I know God. I believe in Jesus. But they have no intention of looking at those Ten Commandments to see if they're pleasing God in their life. God says they're a liar. The Bible says in another way that they're deceived. They're self-deceived. They're deceiving themselves, thinking I'm okay with God just the way I am. God doesn't require anything of me. But as a Christian, God asks a lot of us. He requires much of us. James chapter 2.19, it's more than just believing. The Bible says, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well, and the devils also believe, and they tremble. The devils believe there's God. You better believe it. They used to live with Him. They believe in God. They have a lot more evidence that God is who He says He is than we ever will until He comes again. And they believe, but they don't obey. They don't keep the commandments. They're, they're, they're not in any interest. They're not at all interested in keeping the law of God. Actually, they're in a state of rebelling against God. And that's where we are, too, without the God granting us that grace and granting us the opportunity to repent and turn. Repentance, by the way, is not just saying sorry. That's confession. Repentance is saying, Lord, I'm sorry, I never want to do that again. Repentance is a literal turning away in the opposite direction. That's what the word repent means. If I'm going north, is that north? I don't know. If I'm going north, I repent of going north by doing this, going directly the opposite direction. That's repentance. So repentance is more than just a confession with the mouth. There's an actual change in the life, a change in behavior. And so it, there's more to it than just believing. More to it than just claiming the name Jesus. Because that's what Jesus said. Look, they, they say, Lord, Lord. 
and yet they don't do. Matthew 24, remember we go back, it says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Remember, I told you we are going to come back to this. This idea that iniquity and the endurance. So now we know what iniquity is, right? Iniquity is, the, is sin, right? What is sin? Sin is the breaking of the commandments of God, right? That's what the First John said, transgression of the law. So sin is breaking the law of God. What do you think enduring then is? If it's the opposite of the iniquity, enduring is keeping. I can show it to you in Scripture. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12, talking about the people of God just before Jesus returns. Those who are, who are having to go through the, the difficult times of the end of time. They're going through all the prophecies that we're seeing happen all around us. So it might be us in verse 12 of chapter 14. I hope it's us. The Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Some of your Bibles may say the steadfastness of the saints. Some of your Bibles might say correctly the endurance of the saints. That word endurance that John uses there in Revelation 14, verse 12, here is the endurance of the saints. That same word, translated patience, steadfastness, or endurance, that word comes from the word Jesus used in Matthew 24, who said, He who endures until the end shall be saved. What sort of endurance was Jesus talking about? He that endures, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's both believing and doing. Believing and doing. Revelation 22:14 also says, Blessed are they that do His commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. That word do is really important. So he, this is the people who get to go to heaven, by the way. The, 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 you know, they get to go into the city of God. They get to eat the fruit from the tree of life that was taken away from the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned. Anybody want to eat the fruit of the tree of life? It has 12 different fruits, each in a different month. We're going to study that one of these nights. We're going to study heaven one of these nights. The Bible's thick with details of what heaven is really like. It's amazing. So here it is. It says, to, if you want to be there, you have to do His commandments. Do you know what that word do means? That word do is not just like, you know, I just, you know, if I do, I, that action, that's a doing kind of thing. This is do meaning habitually performing. It's part of your habit of life. You're habitually performing the commandments of God, which means you've given your heart and your life over to the the Lord and the Holy Spirit is working in you so that what your habit of life is, what your customs are, the, the things that you normally do, that you naturally do now, are you do the commandments of God. You're so in tune with Jesus. You're so walking step by step with the Lord Jesus that you never think of doing anything that's displeasing to God. And if you do, you're, you're on your knees saying, Lord, please don't ever let me do that again. Show me before I step into that mess. I don't, even, I don't want to displease you. I want to live for you. Because I love you because of what you've done for me. And this do is that, that sense of that. It's, it's I continually do it. I do it because I love him. I do it because God has given me the strength to do it through the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, which he promises, that, that sanctifying by the Holy Spirit unto obedience that we looked at in 1 Peter. That's what that's talking about. This is describing the people of God who are going to attain everlasting life with Jesus. But in all that, the doing doesn't get you there. Isn't that crazy? The doing doesn't get you there. But it's not just doing, remember? It's keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There's more to it than that. Ecclesiastes 12.13 says, Let us hear the whole conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I could wrap up right there. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, impressed by God. He said, Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. But it's interesting, this is very similar to a verse in Revelation. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Back in Ecclesiastes, it was fear God and keep His commandments. Here it's fear God and give glory to Him. Very similar, don't you think? Now, is it possible that giving glory to God and keeping His commandments are synonymous in any way, shape, or form. 
according to the Bible, very much so. Because if I keep the commandments of God, if I'm living a righteous life, if I'm living according to the word of God, according to the will of God, I'm living like God. And people see Jesus in me and they don't see the sinfulness. They see the power in me. They see something has changed. I, I run into people that I, if I run into people I used to know back in the days when I was a bar manager and they see me standing up here talking about the Bible to you today, they probably wouldn't even recognize me. My hair was like down to here, right? We have one picture in my all of life that still has that. I'm still trying to find that. I need to destroy that. So there's no record of me having hair past my shoulders. I mean, I, I was a different person. And there's been a change has happened through the working of the Holy Spirit. And here you are. And people look at that and they say, glory to God. So glory to God and keeping His commandments are similar? Sure they are. You know why? Because the law of God and God Himself are described exactly the same in the Bible. You may not be able to read this up there. It's kind of small. Or maybe you can. God is good in Luke 18, 19. The law is good in 1 Timothy 1, 8. You'll get all of this in your handout tonight, so don't write too furiously. God is holy in Isaiah 5, 16. The law is holy, Romans 7, 12. God is perfect in Matthew 5, 48. The law is perfect in Psalm 19, 7. God is pure in 1 John 3, 2 and 3. The law is pure in Psalm 19, 8. God is just in Deuteronomy 32, 4. The law is just in Romans 7, 12. God is true John 3.33, the law is true, Psalm 19.9. God is spiritual, 1 Corinthians 10.4, the law is spiritual, Romans 7.14. God is righteous, Jeremiah 23.6, the law is righteous, Psalm 119.172. The law, or God is faithful in 1 Corinthians 1.9. The law is faithful in Psalm 119.86. God is love, 1 John 1.4.8. The law is love, Romans 13.10. God is unchangeable in James 1.17. The law is unchangeable, Matthew 5.18. God is eternal in Genesis 21.33. And the law is eternal in Psalm 111, 7 and 8. God and the law are identical. Why is that? Because the law describes the very character of God. And what God is asking you is to live like he lives. That's all God's asking. Live like Jesus lived, because Jesus lived by the law of God. Jesus was the epitome. He lived the law to the full. He crammed it full. He, he fulfilled it. it. If you wanted to see a life lived by a human being that lived to the law of God, look to Jesus. And he's the only one we should look to because anybody else we think might be looking pretty good, boy, they, they're living pretty well. I guarantee you they're going to fail you someday. You're going to be disappointed. Never put your trust in the arm of flesh, the Bible says. But look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. He authored it. He put the seed of faith in you. He's willing to finish it through putting the Holy Spirit in you to help you grow into a Christian that gives glory to God. And I say amen to that. Because that's what I want in my life. God and law, exactly the same. To do away with the law, you'd have to do away with God. If God could have done away with the law, He wouldn't have had to have Jesus die on the cross. Because Jesus came to have to satisfy the law for you and me. If God could have changed the law in any way, I'm sure he would have done it. It would have saved Jesus all the suffering and heartache and all of that. And then he could have saved us some other way. But there was no way because God couldn't change the law no more than he can change himself. I'm unchangeable, he said. Some people say, well, today we're under grace. We're under a new covenant of grace. And so it doesn't matter about the law. That's all been done away with. But, but really, is that the case? We're going to study this coming up. Romans 6, 14 through 15. Look at these words in Romans chapter 6. They're so confusing for some, but if we look at it in the context of all of the Scripture, remember we have to look all of the Scripture. Romans chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And they stop there. The Bible says I'm not under the law, I'm under grace, so I don't have to worry about the Ten Commandments at all. But you know, there's a lot more to this chapter. Verse 15 says, what then? Paul says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? He says, God forbid. What is sin? A transgression of God's law. He says what? We're not under the law, so what? Should we break the law because we're... God forbid. So what is he saying? You need to keep keeping the law. 
Keep keeping the Ten Commandments. Matter of fact, look, look a little farther down. It's talking about, in verse 16, it's talking about being slaves to sin. When I was, when I was a bartender, I was a slave to sin. I lived my life, that's, I was a slave to sin. That's what the Bible describes you. You're, you're a slave to whom you obey. I was obeying self. I was obeying the devil. The Bible says in verse 16, Know ye not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. Is it talking about obedience? Sure it is. You're either going to obey, obey yourself and obey sin, or you're going to obey God and obey righteousness. And look at what it says. That's exactly what the Bible says. You're the servants, whoever you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death. So you're either a servant of sin, which leads to death, or you're a servant of obedience that leads to righteousness. Well, that makes perfect sense with everything else we've been studying tonight, doesn't it? God has called you out of sin, out of the slavery of sin, to be a servant, a slave, same word actually. You're a slave unto obedience to God, which leads to righteousness, which leads to a walk with Jesus, which leads to people saying, glory to God, you've changed, and they come to Jesus. And then pretty soon we're all standing on the sea of glass before Jesus in the throne that one final day. Amen. That's the process God wants for each and every one of us. So sometimes people say, well, you're, you, we're, we're under grace. You're, you're, you're under bondage if you think you have to keep the Ten Commandments. I said, look, if you think you don't have to keep the Commandments, you're under bondage to sin. Now I am under bondage, but I'm under the bondage to obedience, which leads to righteousness. I'd rather be under the bondage to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Because he's done everything that possibly could be done. All of heaven pulled out the stops for me. So I can go and be with my Lord. God has sent every effort from heaven, all of the strength of himself, all of the efforts of all the angels, all the energies of all of heaven has been bent toward this world so that you might have a chance to choose to make Jesus your Savior, to have your sins forgiven, and be granted eternal life to live with the Lord. All of heaven. And when I sit down and I think of that, I think, Lord, what possibly can I do to repay you? What possibly can I do? And all Jesus says is, if you love me, obey me. Keep my commandments. And they're not grievous. Romans 3.31 says, the fact that you believe in Jesus establishes the law's veracity. Do we then make void the law through faith? Talking about Ten Commandments. God forbid, yea, we establish the law. That word establish is the Greek histemi. It means to cause, to make, to stand, to make firm, fix, or establish, to uphold or sustain the authority of force of anything. In Romans, Paul there, under the impression of the Holy Spirit, says, look, the very fact that you know that you need Jesus to save you. Do you believe that Jesus died on your cross? For save your sins, if that's in your heart, if it's your faith that you know that Jesus died for you, you actually are sustaining the authority of the law by the very fact that you have faith that you need Jesus. Because if God could have changed the law, Jesus would have never had to die, and you wouldn't be sinning today. But the fact that I know that Jesus had to die for me puts that law firmly entrenched in authority over me but the fact is we're going to talk about this coming up that jesus now stands between me and that law because when i stand in front of that law i don't cut it neither do you by the way <laughs> we don't but jesus he took our place he stands there for us he's our he's our judge He's our advocate. He's the lawyer standing beside you. And instead of standing beside you, he stands in front of you. Amen. And they're saying, well, the sins of this guy. And you're like, what guy? He, you know, I'm here, he says. Those are mine. And I paid for those. Gone. You can go free. That's the process. Isn't that wonderful? What more can I do for the Lord who's done that for me? It's about, it's about rowing a boat really. It's about rowing a boat. How many of you have ever rowed an old rowboat? Younger kids never raise their hand, but all of us old guys, we all raise our hand because we know what a rowboat. Nowadays, they travel around with little motors on. 
You know what a rowboat is. You're going out fishing in a rowboat. What happens if you put one oar in the boat and you just row with one, right? You just kind of go in circles, don't you? I mean, you don't go anywhere. That's what happens if you try to live life by faith only. I just believe in Jesus, but I have no righteous works in my life. I have no, I'm not working with obedience in my life. I'm just, I just claim the name of Jesus. You're rowing with one oar in the water. Same thing as if you put that oar in. That's, by, by the way, that's called presumption. That's called presumption. I can believe in Jesus, but I don't have to worry about obeying him. Right? He's going to forgive me no matter what I do. That's presumption. I can put that oar in, the, and I can row with the law. I can row with obedience. And what am I going to get across the lake? I'm not going to get any farther than I was with the other row. Why? Because that's called legalism. I'm going to work my way. I'm going to be good, and I'm going to go to heaven because I'm doing it, and I don't have any faith to connect with it. You and I, if we want to row that boat straight across where Jesus wants us to, we have to have both oars in the water. Amen? We've got to be pulling with faith and works, faith and obedience together. Because we believe that Jesus is saving us. We believe that the Holy Spirit is working in us. And we see the evidence in our lives and we're doing what God is asking us to do. Faith and obedience. It's taught all the way through Scripture. It's what God has called us to. And James 4.17 says, knoweth there, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So if we know to do good and we don't do it, that's sin. Which brings us back to Matthew 7 when we look at those people there that said, Lord, Lord. And Jesus said, but they weren't doing the will of my Father. He said, depart from me, ye that work. What were, they were doing something, right? They were working. Depart from me, ye that work, iniquity. The word iniquity literally means lawlessness. They were working at breaking the law. They weren't doing the law. They weren't doing the commandments. They weren't obeying God. They were claiming, Lord, Lord, but they were willing to live their lives in opposition to the law of God. <clears throat> Pretty clear when the Bible speaks of it. And so we come to our idea of this idea of not denying the power of God. We read this the other night in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Turn there quickly with us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. <clears throat> this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. You remember this verse from last night? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. Saying, Lord, Lord, I believe in Jesus, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. You know what the power of God is for you? The power of the Holy Spirit for working in you is to take you from a life of sin, change you from the very inside, change the way you think, change your habits, change your desires, change your appetites, change your preferences. Everything changes because you've changed servants. You've changed lords. You've changed The Lord is no longer the Lord of this world. Your Lord now is the Lord of heaven. And you said, I've changed my life, and the Holy Spirit comes into me, and now I have the power to live a new life through the Holy Spirit living in me. But some people deny that power. They say, well, I'm going to believe in Jesus, but Jesus can't help me with this. I'm going to be doing this until the day I die. I'm just, I'm just going to keep on doing this. It's the way we've always done it, so I don't really need to worry about it. And God has his commandments, but those are old. You know, They're kind of done away with. But that's not what the Bible says. The, 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 the power of God is greater than the power of sin. Do you believe that? I believe the, the, power, the, the power of God is greater than the power of sin. And so if there's sin in my life, if something is sinful, which means it's a breaking of God's commandment, and God said, look, turn away from that, then if I'm trusting in God and the Holy Spirit, I should, if I really lean on God and not on my own strength, He will give me the power to turn away my back on that, and I don't have to worry about that anymore. I shouldn't say I don't have to worry about that anymore, but I can overcome that, because that's what Jesus wants you to do, is overcome. You might still have to be watchful, because the devil will always tempt you. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power. Revelation 12, 17, it's an end-time issue. 
The whole idea of obeying God. The red dragon was wroth with the woman. The dragon is the devil. The woman is the church at the end of time. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Over and over and over again in Revelation, in the New Testament, in John, in Matthew, in, in, in 1 John, it's saying, keep the commandments, keep the commandments, keep the commandments. And the people at the end of time that the dragon hates the most are those who keep the commandments of God. If the devil's angry at me, I'm on the right side. Seriously. If God's upset with me, if God is displeased with me, then I'm on the wrong side. If the devil's happy with me, you're definitely on the wrong side. But he's angry, he's wroth with these people because they keep the commandments of God. That was the endurance that Jesus was talking about. Mark 3.35, Whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus says, you want to be part of the family of God tonight? Then do the commandments of God. Live obediently to Jesus to the commandments of God. Why? Because you love Jesus for what he's done for you. That's the purpose. That's the reason. It's an expression of my love. It's an expression of my love. It's the power of God working in me to change me from the person I used to be to the person God wants me to be. I want us all to be part of the family of God tonight. I really do. So I'm going to close tonight with a prayer. I know sometimes we sit down and we think, well, you know, that seems kind of harsh. seems kind of tough. God has these, these laws. But no, they're not grievous at all. They're not grievous at all. It's the way of righteousness. It's the way God desires to give you the power to live so that you can be a glory to Jesus. Let's pray tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you for the moment that we've been able to share together. Lord, we've seen that the devil would have us believe that we don't have to worry about those Ten Commandments that you've given to us. But Lord, your Bible says so much differently. Your Word says that you desire us to keep them. And Lord, we know that we can't keep them without your strength. And yet you desire us to do it, not to gain salvation, not to gain heaven, but because you've offered us an opportunity. And because we love you for that. Because you died in our stead and you paid our price. So Lord, tonight we, we pray that you would instill in us a, a desire to live to please you. Lord, I desire that even every person here would, would choose to want to do the will of God. And Lord, let us look into that law and let us see where the places where we should avoid and show us the places in us that you would desire to make more like you. We thank you for your presence here tonight, Lord. We ask that you watch over us and watch between us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Tomorrow night we're going to talk about the second coming. We've talked about a lot of issues, about a lot of signs that it's coming close. Tomorrow night we're going to talk about what it's really going to look like. The Bible describes Jesus' second coming quite accurately, uh, without, any dis without any gray area. So we're going to look at how Jesus is going to come tomorrow night. Very important because there's, there's deceivings that, that fall in line with that as well. So we want to make sure that we're, we're right in line with the Word of God. So make sure you come tomorrow night. Don't forget there's outlines as you leave from tonight's session. There's uh, the schedules you have. And then we're going to meet not Thursday but Friday. And Friday we're going to be talking about false Christs and the Antichrist revealed. So we're going to be looking at the first half of the Antichrist revealed. You certainly don't want to miss that because there is a second half. And uh, it's quite a study, folks. We're going to let the Bible tell us who the Antichrist is. So when you go from this place, remember you can leave here, but you can never go so far to be beyond the reach of God's love. He loves you. He cares for you. He's always loved you. And he's coming again for you. God bless you all and good night.